This week, I am rebroadcasting an episode where I spoke with Diana Wu David, who is the author of Future Proof, Reinventing Work in the Age of Acceleration. If you have listened to this podcast long enough, you've heard me discuss a number of concepts that I attribute to Diana and her book. Cue the music. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast, brought to you by Career Pivot. This podcast is where those of us in the second half of life come together to discuss how to repurpose our careers for the 21st century. Come listen to career experts give you proven strategies, listen to people like you tell their stories on how they repurpose their careers, and finally, get your questions answered. Your host, Mark Miller, has made six career pivots over the last 30 years. He understands this is not about jumping out of the frying pan into a fire, but rather to create a plan where you make clear, actionable steps or pivots to a better future career. Are you ready to repurpose your career? Welcome to episode 286 of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. My name is Mark Miller, and I'll be your host every Monday for a discussion on what it's like to repurpose your career. This podcast episode is releasing on the U.S. Labor Day holiday. Therefore, I'm rebroadcasting an episode where I spoke with Diana Wu David, who is the author of Future Proof, Reinventing Work in the Age of Acceleration. If you listen to this podcast long enough, you've heard me discuss a number of concepts that I attribute to Diana and her book. Let me read you her about section on LinkedIn. I am a former Financial Times executive, author of Future Proof, Reinventing Work in an Age of Acceleration, and an adjunct professor at Columbia's Business School, EMBA Global Asia. I started out my career working on high-level strategy as a management consultant as an assistant to Dr. Henry Kissinger at Kissinger Associates in New York. I work with global leaders, companies, and boards to enhance their ability to adapt, contribute, collaborate, and grow. I'm privileged to have consulted with or spoken to clients including the Mandarin Oriental Hotel Group, the World Bank, Expedia, Randstad, and Credit Suisse. I write about future of work for publications including Fast Company, Inc., Thrive, and speak globally on the future of work corporate governance and boards, and East-West issues. Now, I have re-edited this episode. There is so much good stuff in it that even if you've listened to it when it originally published in July of 2021, you should listen to it again. However, before we get to the episode, let's have a word from our sponsor, Career Pivot. The Career Pivot membership community is a group of people from all over the U.S. and Canada with diverse backgrounds. This is a community where everyone is there to help everyone else out, figure out what they want to do in the second half of life, and then make it happen. Many have made changes that they did not know existed or was possible when they came to the community. They learn from each other and broaden their horizons on what was really possible. Let's hear what Greg had to say about being part of the community. I joined the community when I was in the midst of a career transition. And what I needed was I needed unbiased input and support and observations from folks who would present me with their point of view that would help me figure out what I'd like to do next. And I didn't want to do it with people who lived around me or past professional colleagues. So that's where Mark and the community have been really instrumental. So I've got a built-in support network who will be genuine, honest, and supportive. I am recruiting new members. If you are interested in learning more about the in the endeavor, please go to careerpivot.com slash community. Before we get started, there are a few terms I want you to listen for in this episode. Identity foreclosure is the first one revival of the guild, and the third is culture of experimentation. If you hear these terms, I want you to re-listen to those sections as I think they are important topics. Now on to my discussion with Diana Wu David. Welcome to the Repurpose Your Career podcast. I am honored to have Diana Wu David 
who is the author of the book, Future Proof, Reinventing Work in the Age of Acceleration. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks so much, Mark. Great to be here. Well, I, I don't know whether it's your literary agent or who approached me. I get approached by tons of authors, and this is the one that, you're one of the few that filtered through. <laughs> well, I'm honored. I feel like you and I have a huge passion in common to um, help people who are looking to um, continue contributing across a hundred year life, really. So I feel like it was a match made in heaven. I like to think that it was the universe that brought us together. <laughs> okay. So what was the impetus that got you to write this book in the first place? Well, I was working at Financial Times and I basically did corporate entrepreneurship and we decided we would go into education and I started a board director program because that is, you know, perfect demographic for Financial Times audience. It's generally over 55, executive, et cetera. So after about five or six years of, of launching this board director program, I kept having people say, Diana, we have to go to coffee. And these were incredibly successful people and, you know, lawyers and, and entrepreneurs and, and professionals. And they would all sit down and say, okay, so I did my lifelong learning, which we're all supposed to do now. But, I, you know, and you seem to know a bit about the future of work. What should I do? And I, I kept thinking like, who are these people? And why are they asking me? <laughs> and, um, and it was interesting to me. And I was also in transition uh, a couple of years ago from my corporate job to a portfolio career of multiple different jobs and revenue streams and um, activities. And so I decided to write the book for them. And so that I didn't have to have coffee five times a day to see what we could find, because I'm somebody who likes to talk to people to learn. And I interviewed 100 people who uh, around the world who seemed like they they knew something I didn't about how to set up life well for, I guess, the second half or so. And all the research that I'd done clipping uh, about the trends and future of work. And then I wrote this book. So it's really for them. You broke the book up into three parts. Part one is learn how and why the world of work is changing. And boy, coming out of COVID, is it changing? Absolutely. So the most amazing thing about this is that this book was written right before COVID. And I've spent my career um, recently, you know, in Asia as an executive with a team that was across Asia. So we've been virtual forever. And so part of the book is just to talk about the fact that that linear model that I grew up with of if you behave well and you go get good grades and you go to school and then you get a nice job, then you will be safe, right? And, and successful, whatever that means. And what I found is that that's just not the case. So companies now... The, the lifespan of a company, for instance, based on S&P 500 has gone from 60 years, you know, a couple decades ago to 12. So even if you're the, the best person, you know, that and work as hard as you can, all of a sudden we're working longer, company lifespans are shorter. And it used to be the big risky thing to be an entrepreneur, but now the risky thing is to count on being in one job in one company, you know, in one place for your whole career. So that is really the essence of the change in terms of work. Then the other aspect was the, the globalization. So I've been, you know, that's been part of my career. Um, and I see a lot of people not understanding that it's going to impact them. And in fact, thinking that maybe they can hide from it. Like, I'm just going to start a little bakery, you know, in my hometown, and I'm not going to think about it. And yet, you know, the price of wheat is incredibly <laughs> um, dependent on our global marketplace. And the trends that you see are incredibly dependent on the global marketplace. And even the 
um, people within most countries are, you know, changing because of global inflows and exflows. Um, and then finally, it was demographics. So demographics is something that not a lot of people ever talk about, at least at that time for the future of work. But oh my gosh, the, the day the book came out, and for me, it was like, oh, it's a book about the future of work. The head of diversity and inclusion at Pfizer was like, wow, you just nailed it. We have been so focused on the millennials. We have had no focus on perennials. We have no had not focused on the fact that all of our best people are walking out the door because of a retirement age that was set, you know, when we all lived to 37. And we have done nothing to address it. Yeah, it's interesting. I just I just saw an article about Australia saying that, you know, the next 10 years. 25% of the population will be over 50. In so many places. Yeah. Yeah. And I, you know, I grew up exactly in, in that model. I graduated from college. I went to work for the Borg. I mean, IBM. And I was supposed thinking I was going to work there for 30 years and then retire. And then 22 years in, they screwed me in my pension. And which turned out to be a really good thing because I went to work for a tech startup that was successful. But that's not how it was supposed to work. It's so hard to to make that adjustment. Yeah, I've I've had a lot of friends when I left who were going, wow, boy, are you really stupid? And it turned out I did a really smart thing. I wouldn't have survived the next big layoffs from IBM. That is something that really speaks to the community that I've started to build and that you started to build that idea of people saying, you know, you're really stupid because <laughs> I find that, you know, when we shift from one identity and one mode of being to another and, you know, social science calls that identity foreclosure. And it, it's the hardest thing. And you're inevitably surrounded by people who are potentially just as scared as you have, who have also been in, you know, in all the old patterns of your life. And so to have people, a new community of people who are trying to go into those new things is so valuable. Um, and so I wrote about it in my book as this, you know, the idea of how the, the revival of the guild almost. So sometimes it's around what you're doing. Um, but sometimes it's just around, you know, not just your professional affiliation, but the transition that you're making. And I think that's really important. Well, it's interesting. I had Ashton Applewhite on the podcast about a year and a half ago, and she's an expert on ageism. And one of the things she talked about was how we self segregate by age. And this is just natural, everything from daycare to, you know, in going through school, going through, we eventually, we tend to have friends who are our same age. And when we reach this second half of life, we actually have to change who we associate with to incorporate younger people. That is an interesting thing. When I surveyed my audience as to what some of the things they most wanted to learn one of them was, how do I build a demographically rich community or council or group of friends or whatever you want to call it, just to help me keep fresh and, you know, et cetera, because you do end up, especially in certain parts of life when you don't have a lot of time for anything else, I'm thinking children, uh, you know, with just those people that, that kind of fit into your life. Uh, and then I guess the beauty is you get to have more space and time, you know, for, for some of us at different times than others, then you can actually expand that. And I, I personally have had a very diverse group of people all the time. So it was surprising to me because I've been thinking about it ever since then going, how could we do that? How does that work? It seems like the people who have that just naturally do it. So how do you do it with the people who want it, but don't know how to get it? So in part two of your book, you say cultivate the virtues to stay engaged and relevant. And I think the important term there today is relevant. 
that is something that people have a lot of fear about the fear of obsolescence, the fear of, um, and it's a really valid fear, right? Because in a, in, especially in a big corporation, uh, like I've been in, and I've also been in startups, people love when you can do a job well, and the inclination is to keep you there as long as they possibly can until you are not relevant. And then they fire you. <laughs> I mean, that's sort of, that's been my experience. And, and um, it's one of the reasons I left, you know, my job before I felt like that was possible. The thing that everybody asks is how, how can I stay relevant? And the four things that I um, came up with after doing all this research and all these interviews was a culture of experimentation. So that's something that is frankly being taught in schools now to primary school kids, but you know, aside from maybe high school biology hypothesis test, blah, 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 you know, we really, many of us didn't um, get rewarded for experimenting. So taking small bets, I found was the big thing that people did. And my background in corporate innovation was very much about that, that idea of let's look at what's going on. Let's look at what the future opportunities are and what my value is. And then let's just do the smallest possible action to move forward. And not because I'm launching a podcast or I'm writing a book, but it's really about like, do I even want to do this? That's your, that's the hypothesis you're testing. And for many people who are in a job and then moving to another, that may be very different. They have no idea. So they do need to, to take those small bets. Um, maybe it's just putting an article on LinkedIn or on Medium instead of saying, I'm going to write a book now. That's my next five-year project. So that is fantastic. Um, reinvention, getting the idea of, okay, going from basically a job mindset to a value mindset. Like what is the value that I can produce in the world? So you're not an accountant. You're not, you know, you may be an accountant, but you're not just an accountant. Sometimes it's that you have a facility with people and you're able to explain complex concepts in a really simple way that everybody understands. And that could be a value that you've discounted, but could be very relevant for the future. And you could become a teacher. And so experimenting um, and reinvention focus, which is something that's very difficult to do, especially if you leave the corporate routine. Um, so something to develop and then collaboration, because as we all become company of one, which is a big trend in the future of work and the power of one, we have to put more investment in building trust and collaborating with people outside the structure and the hierarchy that's basically told us where we fit. It's interesting, even running my own business, I have built the people around me to support me and I can choose how much help I need. And, and it's everything from my co-author, Susan Leahy to Stephanie, my virtual assistant uh, my book, my book cover designer, and by the way, they're all over the place. And my mommy Sarawa, my book cover designer, is in Ghana. My co-author, who used to be in Austin, is now in Porto, Portugal, and my VA is somewhere on the west coast of Florida. I don't even know where she is, <laughs> and I can do it and kind of pay as I go. That's a radical difference of growing up in the corporate world. It is. And I think it scares the hell out of people who have kind of been paid no matter what, and then have to demonstrate their value as they go along. You know, that that is difficult, but I think that it's a huge opportunity. And my experience, and I know it's been yours too, has just been that there's so much that I can do and so many people I can work with. Um, and corporates and other individuals, um, and even just going forth to to birth my own ideas. And it's certainly something that I can get paid for. And because there's multiple revenue streams, if, for instance, in COVID, going in, I used to give keynote speeches all over the world and and fly there because they paid when you showed up in person. <laughs> 
And that dissolved right at COVID. And so being able to then have my online community and, you know, the um, teaching that pivoted to online and et cetera, saved me. And if I had just been reliant on my one job, then it never would have worked. So I want to step back because the one thing that most people are scared to do is the experiment phase. You, you have some examples in the book, but can you kind of say, how should people go about experimenting? I think that giving some of the examples might be, you know, from other people might be the best option. And these are, these are not even in the book. These are in the community of people that I have brought in together who are going through this transition. So one of them, Aisha Fauzi, who I recently wrote about for Nikkei, she was a senior aircraft finance lawyer and so incredibly assertive and powerful and really go-getting. And she was um, looking at the different options, didn't know what she wanted to do. So she thought, okay, I'm a lawyer, so maybe I can go on boards. That will be an interesting way to A, earn money and B, intellectually engage myself in my encore career. So she did um, some board courses and that was her small experiment in that sphere and found that that was interesting and it credentialed her and it gave her a bit of a network. And so at the same time, she thought, I do not want to live in a giant expensive city. Um, My husband and I have always wanted to do more for the environment. That's the the sort of deep cause that I want to spend the rest of my couple of decades on. And so they started going to visit on their vacations, permaculture, and they, they went to one in Bali and they went to one, you know, in in different places around the world um, over years, right? Not like, okay, now this year we're going to do five visits. It was a longer term experimentation And they weren't even sure what would happen or what would come of it. And ultimately what they decided is that they would move to, they ended up moving to Bali because it's a much lower cost of living. There's a lot more permaculture farming that's going on there. And they decided to um, arrange their advisory work. So she left her her aircraft finance job, which was a good idea, actually, because it's not doing so well in COVID. And if she hadn't really been thinking about all the different things she might do in her encore career, she she would have been in such a hole. And, And her husband was in hospitality. I mean, talk about bad portfolio of activities across, you know, a couple And so they are now building up that um, next step through multiple different um, opportunities. She started an impact podcast. She's gotten involved in other um, organizations that are focused on climate change and helping them. So that's a sort of experimentation, you know, right now, sort of since the book that I've been seeing over and over. And it is really that what do I want to do? What am I interested in? And what's the smallest thing that I can take smallest imperfect action forward that I can take. And maybe it's just calling somebody who knows more about it than you for coffee. I've got a course on Amava right now on, so you want to be an expat. And Mm. one of the things I learned in teaching the first several 30 or 40 folks was the decision is a very experiential decision and not a logical one, which means you have to go actually go experience it and trust your instincts rather than I'm a recovering engineer. I'm incredibly logical. I have to learn to say, okay, we need to go try this and see how we like it and find out what it, how it really is. And which means you have to go experiment. So in the last piece, the last part three is maximize the impact of your actions. Can you talk about the part three? Absolutely. So if people have gone through and decided, yeah, I feel much more comfortable. I'm ready to experiment. I'm ready to reinvent. 
what I found at the very end was there was still that piece of, okay, um, how do a, how do I put that together into my life and B how do I actually, like we talked before, how then do I start moving more towards this new idea, identity, um, and frankly, a new version for myself of what success is? Because that seemed to be a barrier. It was sort of the psychological barrier. Okay, I got this, all this stuff. At some point, you have to let go of the old thing in order to move to the new. So if you're an expat, you know, it's one thing to say, I'm an expat and I'm here, but I still have my own house. And, you know, if you're in, in Mexico, you still have a house. And no, we don't rent it because we might want to go back and, and that kind of thing. Um, that's so hard for all of us. Uh, and I totally get it. So some of the things there were really about doing a life audit. So starting to shift to the new by looking at what kind of finances you had, what kind of, um, the life audit was finance, trust, what kind of relationships you had. And I have a future-proof assessment and people are always surprised. Um, I'll send you a link, but it's bit.ly um, prepare for future. And it is basically, do you have the resources that, and it's relationships and it's, you know, time and, and foresight and reflection um, to really do things. And, uh, and, and it is the other part of the life audit is just time. And people find that they've been spending a lot of time on things that they thought were important, but are not. And it's starting to realign, basically, according to your values. And then the other part of it is the minimum viable lifestyle. Instead of minimum viable product, it's about thinking, what do I really need? What is it that I can, you know, kind of Tim Ferriss, the four hour work day um, or work week um, calls it fear setting. Like what is the worst thing that could happen and financially usually, and what, what is, um, what can I do about that? So for instance, one of the people I um, spoke to who's a writer used to be a salesperson. And she said, you know what? I just, all I want to do is write. And so she said, okay, writing is a really terrible way to make money generally. <laughs> so, um, so let me figure out what happens when I go to, um, you know, Colorado and I'm not making my sales um, salary. And she actually said, okay, I'm going to rent this place and I may have to work at 7-Eleven. So if I'm working at 7-Eleven and I make this much money, what is in my life? And am I okay with that? And that's sort of the minimum viable lifestyle that she set for herself. And then from there, she was like, okay, now what do I want to do? Well, I want to write and I want to, you know, spend, she climbs mountains. So she, she wanted to spend more time rock climbing. And so that's really the, the impact. It's kind of what, where the rubber meets the road, where you're able to then start scaling and making things um, real. Yeah, I've had several people on the podcast, and I've got one that's going to follow this with John Tarnoff, where we talk about mindset shifts. Yeah. Right? And we have, most of us grew up with a certain belief system, and mm -hmm. it's around money and status and what work is supposed to look like. And very often, the relationships we build very often keep us there. Very true. Right. And so therefore, sometimes you need to change those relationships. I'm a, I'm a huge fan of um, Dr. Henry Cloud's book, uh, Necessary Endings, mm, yeah. uh, where in order for new things to begin, we often have to end old things. By the way, we suck at ending things. We really do. <laughs> <laughs> One of the pieces is if you in order to kind of build that mindset shift that will suddenly go, okay, what do I really want to do? What's really going to make me happy? And it's not what was programmed into me by my parents or by society or expectations or 
I know my last three years here in Mexico, I've had huge mindset shift. I've had all kinds of things kind of shoved in my face going, do I really want to keep doing certain things? And the answer is no. <laughs> yeah. Well, COVID, I think, was this giant mindset shift. It really was a creative destruction. It broke habits that we thought we never, we could never stop going to work and, and so many of those things. So it's a real opportunity to come out and really say, mm, like, if I didn't have to do any of this, how would I start to reinvent my work? How would I start to reinvent my life? And I hope that people take advantage of that. We've all gone through a lot of stress. So to a certain extent, there's this desire to go back to and hunker down. But I think after we have a taste of what it's like to go back, we may just realize that there are so many opportunities to change. Yeah. I When we talked the last time, the Andrew Scott's book, The 100 Year Life, came up several times. And I've had Andrew on the podcast. And um, for anyone, I highly recommend you read it because it it's, work is no longer linear. Our work lives are no longer linear. And many of us, in, I mean, I, I'm 65 now and I don't really want to retire. I want to work on something I want to do, how hard I want to do it and how long I want to do it. But it's my choice, not by someone else's mm -hmm. choice. And with the people that you'd like to do it with. Yes. Well, <clears throat> I think one of the things that I find is really key for mindset shift is the idea of that Jeff Bezos uses at Amazon, which is, is this a two-way door or is this a one-way door? And you can apply it to your expat living. And I think that one of the changes now is that there are so many more two-way doors. There are so many more easily reversible decisions. So if you're thinking about moving somewhere, instead of going and trying to rent a house, and you know, in some countries you have to put a huge deposit down and whatnot, you can just go rent an Airbnb. And furthermore, there's all these new digital nomad communities popping up for you know all ages, not just for for the people who are 20 doing websites. And you really can try a lot of things with it being a two-way door. You know, if you don't like it, you just do something else. So it's a really exciting opportunity. Yeah. It's the willingness to experiment that I know when I went back and saw, I went back in 2019 to, to a nephew's wedding and my sister-in-law, who I hadn't seen in many, many years, was just looking at pictures of where I lived and told her we got rid of all our stuff when we moved to Mexico and her house is full of stuff. I mean, it's packed and that's just like, she just couldn't comprehend. And it's like, no, we tried it. And we liked it. So this has been really good. Uh, Diane, if someone wanted to reach out and contact you, but more importantly, and buy your book, how might they do that? <laughs> Well, they can book, buy the book Future Proof, Reinventing Work in an Age of Acceleration on Amazon. Uh, and my website is Diana, D-I-A-N-A-W-U, David, D-A-V-I-D. Uh, and if they want to do the Future Proof assessment, because the biggest thing that I get asked is, so where do I start? Um, it's 11 questions. It's yes, no. And you see where you're strong and where you're weak. And you start there. And that is at um, bit.ly, B-I-T dot L-Y forward slash prepare for future. And we'll put a link in the show notes for that, along Great. with everything else. So Di Diana, thank you very much for being on the Repurpose Your Career podcast. Thank you so much, Mark. It's been a pleasure to talk to you as always. There are a lot of good nuggets in this episode. If you want to stay relevant and future-proof your career, you will not do it alone. Take a moment and go to careerpivot.com and sign up for the weekly Career Pivot Insights newsletter, which is sent out every Sunday. You'll get a weekly update on this podcast, white papers, and new blog posts. 
I published my latest white paper, Ageism, The Last Acceptable Bias. If you are subscribed to the newsletter, you have already had the opportunity to download it. While there, do not forget to check out the Career Pivot community, which can be found at careerpivot.com slash community. The community is a great place to future-proof your career. Feel free to connect with me on LinkedIn. Look for Career Pivot on Facebook and LinkedIn. You'll also find me on Twitter at Career Pivot. Thank you for listening all the way to the end of the Repurpose Your Career podcast. You will find all the show notes at careerpivot.com slash episode 286. You can also subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Podbeam, Overcast, Spotify, Pandora, Amazon Music, and lots of other places where podcasts can be found. In fact, this podcast can be found on the Repurpose Your Career podcast channel on YouTube. Hope to see you next Monday for another episode of Repurpose Your Career podcast.